Good morning and welcome. Welcome to this time and space that God has created for us to come together, to praise, to worship, to be a part of God's created order. Know that wherever you are, wherever you're coming from, you are welcome here in the house of the Lord. Welcome. Please join me in our opening hymn. Come, O Fountain. Good morning, brothers and sisters. We are so glad to be here today. So glad to have you with us. We have been welcomed. We have sung together. Now let us join our voices together in our call to worship. In this house, you will find bread for your life's journey. In Jesus, we find life anew. Come. Stay a while and eat this bread so you will never hunger. In Jesus we find life anew. Come, be strengthened in God to withstand the present night and the spiritual forces of evil. In Jesus we find life anew. Please join me in our invocation. O oh God, we have no life apart from you. We do not come here to eat bread that fills us for a day. Rather, we come to be nourished by you, and that the love you have for us fills us for a lifetime. May this food strengthen our discipleship, grant that it will renew us, and in us, our commitment to proclaiming the gospel of peace, through our ministries of peace and justice, in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. My friends, we have been greeted. We have been welcomed. We have sung together. We have prayed together. We have been called to worship. Now, let us join our voices together as we confess our sins before God and one another. We profess that you are God, O Holy One. We have no other gods, and yet 
we do not always serve you with sincerity and faithfulness. Our other gods are not the ones of our ancestors, the ones beyond the river or in Egypt or of the Amorites. We struggle with other gods here and now who seek to fulfill us by consumerism and with self-importance. We hear gods who will instill in us such fear of our enemies that we seek power from weapons of destruction. Help us, O God, to find fulfillment in you. Forgive us that we are skeptical, skeptical of love's transforming power. We repent of our sins and turn our hearts again to you. Amen. Hear the words of grace and mercy. No other God cares for us as God does. No other God loves us as God does. No other God forgives us as God does. Thanks be to God. Please join me in our hymn, Blessed Assurance. First scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Joshua, the 24th chapter, verses 1 through 2 and 14 through 18. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors... Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. 
Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods of your ancestors, the ones that they served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors, the ones they served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went, and among all the people through whom we had passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. First section of today's passage is, or today's message is, a solemn vow, question mark. We have to look at what's happening here. So Joshua has just come into power. Moses has died, and Joshua is tasked by God with dividing up the promised land to the various tribes. These are dark and troubling times. The Israelites have lost a beloved leader. Moses is gone. And this new guy, Joshua, whom Moses kind of brought up along the way, is now in charge. And he's tasked with dividing up all of Israel among the tribes. Now we can see where this might be a problem. People are hurting because they've lost Moses. They're worried because they're not sure what this new leader, this Joshua guy, is going to do. And then top it off, he starts making changes right off the bat. He is now telling each tribe what area they get. And some of them aren't getting what they want, and some are getting more than they should, and everybody's upset. Everybody's grumbling. Does this sound like anything that we might have experienced in our lifetime? Have we ever seen anything like this happen in our country, amongst our churches, in our communities, in our families? These are hard times. And in the midst of all of this, Joshua reminds them of what happened in the past. Now, remember what we've been doing all the way along. This is the last of the series. But remember, from the beginning, we started with, okay, what happened in the past? How do we see God in the past? In the word that we have from before, in the history. Now, what does that mean in our present? And it's going to take us on to the future. So Joshua is reminding them of what has happened in the past. That long before this, Abraham and all the rest of them, served other gods. The gods of Egypt, gods on the other side of the river, they served other gods. And our God, the Lord, brought them out from that place, gave them an understanding, gave them faith, fed them, brought them along. He talks about the present. Okay? So they've wandered with Moses for the longest time because of things they had done. They had been fed in the desert. They had the manna and the quail. They broke rules. They wandered for 40 years. And now they've come into the promised land. And they get there, and there are more gods to worship again. They get there, and the Amorites have all these other gods the Baals, and they are excited. 
there are all, no, all sorts of new possibilities, and they're intermingling with these folks, and they're forgetting about God. And then Joshua challenges them. He says, pick who you're going to serve. He says, where is your faith? Are you going to serve the gods of the past? Are you going to serve the gods of this present? Or are you going to serve the Lord? As for me and my house, that's what we are going to do. Now watch what happens here, because this is really important. He's laid everything out. He's talked about this, and they know their past. And I want you to watch what's going on, because these people are going to say something of which they really know nothing. When Moses dies, it is the end of an era. It's the end of a generation. The whole reason for wandering the desert for 40 years was it was a generation. They had to get past all of this history that clung so closely to these folks to become something new, to become what God was challenging them to become. This is extremely important. Now you've got a new leader. You still have that past memory, but it's a memory that isn't quite perfect. We see the same thing in churches, right? Many people remember when there were a thousand people in every church, their Sunday schools were 600 kids. You know, everybody came to church every Sunday and they gave faithfully. And we remember things in such an odd way, only to realize that our memories aren't as good as we thought they were. So Joshua is challenging them. This is a new crowd. He's saying, this was the past, and yet God was there. God took care of us. This is our present, and yet God is here. God has brought us into this promised land. Here's our future. What are you going to do? And the people say, far be it for us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. And they go through and they talk about how he brought their ancestors up, how he took them out of the house of slavery, did great signs in their sight, Protected them all along the way. They are telling, watch what's going to happen here. They are telling the people, are telling God, this is what we remember of you. They're right-sizing themselves with God. Like Solomon. This is what I know of you, Lord. They're humbling themselves, saying, this is what you've done for us. And therefore, we will serve you. We're stepping up in faith. Joshua chooses to serve God, and the people say the same thing. Yes, we will serve God too. Now the question becomes, is this vow something they're taking seriously, or is it something that's just inspired at the moment and they're going to fall away from? And there's not a good answer to this. Some of them are very serious. Some of them are going to fall away. Some of them are going to have their faith challenged, and they're not going to have grown that faith, not going to have strengthened that faith. We talked about this last week. What happens when our faith is challenged? Because right now it's easy. They've just gotten everything. Yeah, there's some disgruntlement over who's getting what and who's going to live where, but all in all, things are really good. They've just gotten the promised land. So everybody's on a high. What's going to happen when that faith is challenged? When suddenly something isn't the way they expect it to be? That will be the test that comes. But for now, they've made a solemn vow to serve God. That in and of itself is the step they are taking. They have been fed they have been given beyond anything they deserved. They've had strife. They grew up in a world where they wandered, and now they get to have a home. They've had hard times. But for now, 
They're making a solemn vow. The question will be, what's going to happen when that vow and that faith are challenged? Will they have the faith that they think they have? And will they have the faith that the past has shown them? That remains to be seen. Please join me in the hymn, Faith of the Martyrs. Our second scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter, verses 56 through 69, and is the end of this particular story that we're dealing with. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them, says Jesus. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the very first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, 
For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Here ends the reading of God's word. May it have rich blessings on your lives. Whom will you serve? That's the question now. See, we talked last week about how Jesus' teaching was extremely hard. And we see today how his disciples are struggling with it. We must eat the body and blood of Jesus? Oh, we talked about that last week. This just doesn't seem right. And many of his followers turn away because of it. It doesn't seem right. This is wrong. They haven't gone through this process of discerning. They haven't gone through the process of building their faith. They have been following, watching signs, and looking for something other than Jesus was. So when Jesus teaches this, they have a hard time. Even after he explains, this is about the Spirit. For the flesh is useless. Remember what I said last week. If we read this and we discerned and we looked at the manna and then talked about what that was about and the fact that it was the Spirit, and then we talk about Jesus and talking about having to eat the flesh and realizing that this flesh, the bread of life, is about the Spirit, Jesus flat out says here, this is about the Spirit. The flesh is useless. This world is nothing compared to the eternal life. But people still fall away. Their faith wasn't strong enough, and they weren't ready to wrestle with the spiritual versus the real world. And we run into this in our daily lives, don't we? When things get tough, we just kind of push it away. We don't want to think about that. When the hard questions come up, we just kind of dodge it until we have to deal with it. And what Jesus is saying is, this will build your faith. And notice how Jesus doesn't argue with them to stay. He doesn't fight with them and say, you've got to figure this out. Instead, Jesus lets them go about their journey. Because they're not ready yet. They're not at that point yet. They may someday. We all walk a spiritual journey. And we're at different places on it. I'm not at the same place as my father. My father's not at the same place as his father. We are not in the same place even amongst clergy. Each of us walks a different path. And we're all at different points along that path. And we may not be at that point where we can accept this teaching at this point. But we still have to wrestle and discern along that journey. That is the only way to get to where we need to go. So as these people are struggling with the real world idea of cannibalism and the fact that this is about the spiritual, the teaching is just too hard, they're not going to deal with it. He's nuts, I'm going back to the people that are going to teach the things I'm comfortable with. Have we ever heard that in our churches? We just got to get back to the things that are comfortable. What if what was comfortable wasn't where we needed to be? What if God was challenging us to get beyond our comfort? That's the question that comes up here. And now Jesus turns to the twelve. He says, do you also want to go away? And this is where Simon Peter comes in. He says, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know you are the Holy One of God. Now remember what I was saying about the solemn vow before with the people? Everything was good for them, for the Israelites. They were just getting everything they wanted. It's easy to make that vow on the high note. But here, Peter is making it not on a high note, but on a note where people are walking away. People are leaving. There's questions about whether or not Jesus' leadership is even worthwhile. But for those who have been wrestling, for those who have been listening, for those who have been 
there through the hard things and seeing what Jesus could do even with that. The ones who had left everything to follow this man. They, they grabbed hold. And sometimes I wonder if that's not the same thing that's happening in today's church. As we struggle, as we look at things and we want things to be a certain way, we want to go back to easier teachings. We want to go back to easier ways of living. We want to go back to what was comfortable. And yet is that bringing about what God is asking us? Is that moving us ahead in the journey? We need to be looking at these things and comparing and discerning and making that next step. So we have talked all the way along about having the word, comparing it to the present. And now Jesus is pushing us. Pushing us to take our faith to the next level. To continue the journey and to push the boundaries to move ahead in new teachings new understandings based on not our feelings, not our gut, but on our discernment, on our prayer, on our trusting in what God has done in the past through the Word, comparing it to what we have learned in the present of God in our own experience, comparing that and seeing where the truth lies, and then taking that and listening for that whisper that Elijah heard, and moving out into a new way of doing things. Being generous with things that God has given us. Loving to an exorbitant amount. Being so gracious with things that people don't understand why we would do that. These are things that Jesus pushed us to do. But the question now becomes, which disciples are we like? Are there people falling away from church? Yes. If we're going to be honest about things, people are falling away from church. People are falling away from the faith. But this has always been something that's been there. It happened to Jesus. People disappeared, and he was left with that core, faithful group. Now, I'm not saying we should push people out of church. I'm not saying we should turn people away. I'm saying, like Jesus, we have to understand that it's okay if people are at a different place on their journey. And they can make that choice. But we can also make the choice to serve. We can make the choice to be discerning, to let our faith be grown and pushed and just completely evolved into something other than what it was before. And again, not based on our guts, not based on our feelings, not based on our wants and desires, but instead based on discernment, on looking at where the past has been, what our present is, and where God is pushing us to the future. This is the important part. This is the part that makes us ask the question, who will we serve? Are we going to serve the gods of the world? Or are we going to serve our God? I want you to give some serious thought to this. As we fight over land, over resources, over power, over money. As we let our families fall apart because we're too busy with our job and making a life to live life. As we're so busy trying to figure out what this world's all about that we completely forget there is a world beyond this. And we don't always have one more day or one more second but that it's important we deal with it now. It's important we do what Paul had told us in our passage last week, that the days are evil. But 
we can live for the moment and do what's right in this moment. So I ask you, where is your faith? Where are you at? Have you discerned? Are you not at that place? Would you like to be somewhere else? You have work to do. Are you comfortable? Faith isn't about comfort, but instead about growth. And growth has always got some discomfort to it. We call it growing pains for a reason. And then once you figure out where your faith is at, then you can ask yourself the question, whom will you serve? I hope that you will be like the disciples. I hope that you will be like Jesus' closest friends. I hope that you will be like the people of Israel as they were going into the promised land and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May you be blessed in everything you're doing. May you find rich blessing in discerning and wrestling and just dealing with the really hard, nitty-gritty stuff that this world brings around and our faith forces us to deal with. May you find faith and peace in those moments when you hear that whisper from God and you have your God moment. And may you always be fed by the living bread, Jesus the Christ, to whom you can turn at any point and have your spirit filled, have your sins forgiven, and have life-altering things happen. Not by your will, but by the will of God. So whom will you serve is the question you have to ask. And it's all based not on feelings, not on guts, not on wants and desires, but on the God that gives you life and the discernment and wisdom you get from that God. May God bless you all. Amen. Folks, our God calls us to give back generously the way we have been given, to offer up our praise and thanksgiving. Let us do so now in this time of offering. Holy One, you have given us much out of your abundant generosity. It is more than we deserve or can truly take in. In these moments of silence, hear our personal prayers and vows to you, whom we choose to serve. Please pray with me. Accept our offerings of praise and grateful thanksgiving for your presence in our lives and the many blessings you bestow upon us. Consecrate our offering, O God, that it may become bread to fill the emptiness and heal the brokenness of the lives in this community and beyond. And may we be reminded that our real life begins when we give with generous hearts and proclaim the gospel in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. My friends, we've made our vows individually. But our God calls us together as a family, as a body, for support, for people to walk with us, who love us, for people who can discern with us and help us as we try to be as wise as possible. Let us join with that body now as we say the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In all that you do, may you be fed through the body and the blood of Christ, knowing full well that your spirit will be renewed, that you can go out into the world serving our God in strength and in faith. Go in peace, my friends. Please join me in our closing hymn, Near My God to You.
My friends, I'm glad you were able to be here today. It is our sincere hope that you have taken something away from this sermon and this service that will help to inspire you, move you, feed you for the week. In all that you do, may you find God. And now I would ask your help. I would ask that you continue to hold us up in prayer, praying for God's strength and guidance and wisdom for us as we discern our way through the world in the ministries we do here. We are involved in many ministries throughout the community, throughout the denomination. And those happen through people like yourselves and the generous giving that you give. So I would ask that in a few seconds, when you see the Donate Now button, click on it and give what you're able. Because through your generosity, we are able to keep the ministries going here that God has called us to. Ministries like this video ministry, ministries as we reach out through counseling, through our VBS, through our Sunday school, through our food cupboard, and through the many other things that we do here and worldwide. And we thank you for all that you're able to give and the generosity that you have. May you have a blessed week until we meet again.